now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We head back to January 19th, 1948, an episode of My Friend Irma starring Marie Wilson. And, of course, that's going to get Jimmy in Boston just all excited because he loves his Marie Wilson. And, uh, well, Irma quit her job. She's seeking, she, she was fired, actually. And, well, you'll hear all about that as we go into the show here. Lieber Brothers Company, makers of Swan, the soap with the exclusive super-creamed blend, presents... Our friend, Swan, with my friend, Irma. Starring Mary Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. Friendship, friendship, just a perfect blendship when other friendships have been forgotten. apartment together, I don't think one has any business telling the other how to live. However, if your roommate gets out of line once in a while, I believe it's perfectly all right to drop a gentle hint. After all, a word to the wise should be sufficient. Of course, if your roommate happens to be Irma Peterson, brother, there just ain't enough words in the dictionary. <laughs> now, please understand me, me, Jane Stacy. I love the girl. Now, go along with her, although sometimes it isn't easy. For instance, the other night I was telling Irma about the lovely dinner party that I attended. I remarked that the table was set with community plate, and Irma said, Community plate? I wouldn't want everybody eating from the same dish. <laughs> <laughs> These things don't bother me. After living with Irma a while, you begin to feel like a handball court. Things just bounce off you. Besides, today is a day for celebration. Irma and I have bought a cute little spinet piano for our apartment. Of course, it's a luxury, but Irma and I are both working, and by skimping here and there, we'll be able to meet the payments. That reminds me. Honey. What, Jane? You know, we're going to make a payment on the piano today, and on the 19th of every month, so I've worked out a little budget for it. Well, I'll do just as you say, Jane. That'll be swell, honey. Yeah, i got to look over this work I brought home from the office. Oh, gee, Jane, your boss has such confidence in you. He trusts you with everything. Well, most bosses do. Not my boss. Mr. Clyde doesn't trust me with anything. He even puts pencils in the pencil sharpener for me. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Maybe he's tired of pointed erasers. <laughs> yeah, well, that happens once in a while. No, only yesterday he called me a bonehead. What for? Well, just as I was opening my lunch, he asked me to get the bank deposit ready, and I got confused. Confused? Yes, because he called me from the bank and said they would not pay interest on three tuna fish sandwiches. <laughs> well, honey, all jobs have their shortcomings. Not yours, Jane. You're a private secretary and I'm a plain stenographer. And Mr. Clyde is always yelling at me, telling me I don't know my work. He can't find anything in the files and when I run out of stamps, I have no business sending a letter COD. <laughs> Well, honey, you should do something about it. I am. What? I'm going to ask for a raise. <laughs> You're going to ask for a raise? Well, Jane, you know, the more they pay you, the more they respect you. Oh, wait a minute, sweetie. You can't do that. We're skating on thin ice right now. We just bought a piano. There are payments to be met. And what if Mr. Clyde fires you? Me? Huh. He wouldn't dare. I'm indispensable. I'm going right down and talk to him. Irma, listen, now, sweetie, don't for worry, my Jane, sake. Now, just leave it to me. I know how to handle Mr. Clyde. Besides, he's hinted many times that I'm in solid with him. In solid with him? Yes, he's often said I had a head like a rock. <laughs> Wait, Irma, listen to no, me, no, honey. Please, Wait, Jane, when I come back, my position will be different. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. 
Well, Miss Peterson, what are you doing here on your afternoon off? I want to speak to you, Mr. Clyde. Well, please make it brief. This is the only chance I get to decipher what you've done all week. <laughs> By the way, as long as you're here, where did you file the letter to Smith and Smith? Where it belongs, under C. C. Mm-hmm. Cough drops. <laughs> Thank you. I had no trouble finding your letter to Liverpool. I looked under G. Oh, how did you know? Simple. Just remember your system. Liver is meat. A pool has water. Water and meat makes gravy. Look under G. <laughs> Now, uh, what's on your mind, Miss Peterson? Mr. Clyde, you know the things I do around this office. Yes. You know how I talk to the clients? Yes. You know how I take care of everything? Indeed I do. Well, I guess there isn't more to be said. There isn't. You're fired. Come in. Hello, Jane. Oh, hello, Richard. I didn't expect you. What's on your mind? Oh, nothing. I just thought you passing by and... Say, what's this? When did you get the piano? Just today. Oh, say, it's nice looking. Uh, hey, nice tone. Yeah. Irma and I always wanted one. It's expensive, but we'll pay it off slowly. Well, you should have a lot of pleasure from it. Oh, does Irma play? Uh, she knows one piece. Kitten on the keys. Oh. How does it sound? Like the cat is caught under the piano. <laughs> but then we both wanted it, and since we're both working, it won't be hard to me. Excuse me, Richard. Hello? Hello, Jane. Honey, where have you been so long? Oh, places. What do you mean, places? What happened with your raise? I didn't get it. Oh. Well, cheer up, honey. Maybe some other day. Yes, in some other company. Some other company? Jane, I got fired. Oh, Irma, won't you ever learn... How could you let yourself get fired at a time like this after we just bought a piano, we've got payments to meet up? Oh, don't worry, Jane. I have something good to tell you when I get home. Where are you? Around the corner. I wanted to break the news to you first. Mm. Well, hurry home. All right, Jane. Uh, I'm in the middle of a banana spit, but I'll ask them to put it in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, honey. Oh, what is she up to now? Now, don't let it upset you, Jane. Oh, Richard, where does that girl get her talent for doing the worst possible thing at the wrong time? So help me, if she wanted to join the Daughters of the American Revolution, she'd get Tokyo Rose to sponsor her. <laughs> well, is there any way that I can be of help? No, 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 Richard, please. Now, Irma and I bought this piano. We're going to pay for it. I can meet my share of the obligation, and Irma will just have to pay hers from the $100 savings she has in the bank. Hello, Jane. Oh, hello, Richard. Hello, Irma. Oh, I was just leaving. I'll see you later, Jane. Goodbye. Bye. Jane, you're not angry at me because I was fired. Well, frankly, I am, Irma. You were a fool to get yourself fired just when we needed the money so badly. But you'll probably get another job in a week or so. We can make the payment on the piano today because I, I just remembered that you have $100 in the bank. <laughs> Irma? You have a hundred dollars in the bank? <laughs> Irma, why are you looking up the ceiling? When flies walk upside down, does the blood rush to their backs? <laughs> Irma Peterson, answer me. You have a hundred dollars in the bank? Please tell Janie you have a hundred dollars in the bank. <laughs> Jane, you see, it was like this. Oh, no. no but but it's, no. but it's good news. I have a chance to get a job as a receptionist next week at the number one Park Avenue shop. A receptionist? Honey, that's the smartest shop in town. Well, all their receptionists come from the finest finishing schools. Honey, they're very ultra, the epitome of culture and refinement. I know. that. That's where I use my $100. I don't understand. Well, I, I want to get that job, so I bought a course in refinement, and it, it's all here in this book. Oh, let me see it. How to become a lady in a week. <laughs> oh, Irma, you didn't spend a hundred dollars on... Oh, Irma. Come in. It's only me, Professor Kropotkin. <laughs> Hello, Janie and Irma, my two little candles. One with a flame, the other with a wacky wick. Uh, <laughs> why, Professor? Sir. Excuse me, a little joke I picked up in the hardware store. <laughs> Girls, I hope you don't mind my coming in here, but I'm hiding from Mrs. O'Reilly. She wants the rent. Why don't you pay it, Professor? 
By me, it's a principle. I refuse to pay rent for a room that's full of cats. <laughs> full of cats? Yes, in my room, they feel safe. They know even a dog wouldn't go in that place. <laughs> Professor, we have our troubles, too. What has Irma done this time? Well, you know the piano. A piano? I didn't know this. Do you mind if I play it? All right, but you better play something short. I have a feeling the piano isn't going to be with us very long. Why not? I lost my job. Yeah. Not only that, but she spent every cent she had on a phony course in self-improvement. Irma, darling, don't try to become a lady. Stay the way you are. <laughs> I mean, so sweet and simple. Return the course and get your money back. Yes, that's exactly what you're going to do now, honey. Come in. Hello, girls. Oh, so there you are, Professor. Hello, Mrs. O'Reilly. Don't you hello me. Yeah. I understand you've been going around telling the tenants you'd like to see me hanging from the rafters. I never said that. Well, that's better. I don't want to be charged extra for the decorations. <laughs> Now, look here, you. Now, please, please, the, the, the two of you. Uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Reilly. I don't want to be curt, but after all, I have a terrible problem here. Irma's lost her job, and she spent every cent she has on a fake course in self-improvement. Oh, Irma, you poor dear. Where did you buy the course? From a man named Sam Bauer. Glory be, does he wear a checkered jacket and talk fast? Yes. Oh, that crook. How could you go to a man like that? Why, how do you know he's a crook? He sold me a book on how to preserve me youth. <laughs> Mrs. O'Reilly, if you'll excuse me I think he sold you the wrong book Your youth doesn't look like it's been preserved Looks more like it's been pickled <laughs> Oh, hush up Now, Professor, let's let the girls alone We'll go up to your room and talk about an operation What operation? The one you're going to need if you don't give me the rent <laughs> Bye, girls and Irma gets your money back. Now, sweetie, that's exactly what you're going to do because you're out of a job. And we need that hundred dollars desperately or they'll take the piano and we'll be the laughing stock of the neighborhood. Oh, I understand, Jane, but please don't mention a word of this to Al. Why not? Well, I want Al to have confidence in me because, you see, when he and I get married, I, I, I want to handle the money in the family. Yeah, well, I, I think that's fair. After all, you'll be the only one who's working. <laughs> January 19th, 1948, Marie Wilson, my friend Irma on Classic Radio Theater. Well, you've heard me talk about Michael Lindell, the inventor of my pillow, and how his pillow's given me a great night's sleep. He continues to roll out new offers on his products. His latest on the towel sets. Now, towels aren't something you think about. I never knew what I was missing till I tried the towels last year. You've all helped build my pillow into the incredible company it is today, and trust in Mike Lindell has given you a better night's sleep. Mike's now changing the game with his six-piece towel set, USA cotton, extremely absorbent, yet still providing that soft feel you look for in the towel. Two bath, two hand towels, two washcloths for a limited time, $39.95 using our promo code USA. It retails for over $100. Remember, all MyPillow products come with a 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener square, use this promo code USA to get this price of $39.99 on the towels. Or call 1-800-951-8175. I'm Wyatt Cox, this is Classic Radio Theater, and this is more of My Friend Irma, starring Marie Wilson, from January 19th, 1948. Well, I'm at home, pacing the floor, waiting for Irma to come back with the $100 that she spent on that worthless culture course. Oh, gee. I hope she gets it, because there's a payment due on the piano. I don't want to be at the keyboard playing ballerina while two truck drivers dance off with the piano. <laughs> Hello, Jane. Irma, did you get the money? No, there was a note on the door. Out to lunch. I think Mr. Bauer likes Mexican food. Mexican food? Yes, because the policeman in front of his office said, this guy is headed for the border. Oh. <laughs> Irma, there goes the hundred. Are you angry, Jane? Irma, I don't know what I am any longer. 
All I know is that I've been living with you for a year, and everything you've bought in that time has been a swindle. First, that refrigerator. Well, everybody buys a refrigerator. Without a motor? <laughs> well, the man said that, that without any moving parts, it would last longer. <laughs> all right. All right, it could happen. What about the time you wanted a fur coat, and I told you to go to I.J. Fox? Where did you go? I.J. Wolf. <laughs> He said he was a distant relative. Mm. And what kind of fur did you buy? Well, the man said it was a genuine mink dyed squirrel colored leopard spotted caracal beaver. <laughs> Honey, I told you that that many animals haven't gotten together since they walked into Noah's Ark. <laughs> now understand me, sweetie. I, honest, I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm only hoping that by pointing out your past mistakes, you won't be so gullible in the future. It's just they make it sound so reasonable. Oh, sweetie, what's the use of talking anymore? You have no job, you haven't any money, we can't meet the payments on the piano. All you have is a book, How to Become a Lady in One Week. Oh, please don't start to cry, Jim. Oh, well, what do you expect me to do? They'll take the piano back and my credit won't be good any place in town and my charge accounts will be canceled and I so Irma. Oh, Jane, maybe they're coming for the piano. Shall I hide it? <laughs> yes, put it under the rug. <laughs> Come in. Hello, Jane. Hiya, chicken. Hello, Al, honey. Well, kids, I've done it again. Oh, Al, not another one of your deals. What is it this time, dipping tapioca in ink and selling it for caviar? <laughs> What's the matter with you, Jane? You seem bitter. Me? Bitter? Oh, don't be silly, Al. I feel wonderful. In fact, I'm going to take a little trip. I'm going out of my mind. <laughs> Inhibited, Jane? Chicken, what's up? Al, I got fired. Fired? Chicken, how can you tamper with my future like that? <laughs> That's the worst news I've heard. No, it isn't, Al. I also spent my life savings on this course. Let me see. How to become a lady in a week. Chicken, how could you? Well, I wanted to get some poise and cultured. Haven't you ever felt that way? But me get poise? Chicken, I'm loaded with it. <laughs> how many guys do you know who can walk into a theater backwards, light a cigarette, and say to the doorman, going out for a smoke, call me when the newsreel is over? <laughs> no, Chicken, you shouldn't have bought this book. Hey, what'd you pay for it? A hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Chicken, I think you've laid an egg again. Well, uh, oh, 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 Al, there must be something else we can do. Yeah, well, if there is, there's only one man who can help us. Who, Al? Who else but... Hello, Joe. Al, got a problem. Got to find a job. For me? Joe, don't be funny. It's for Irma. She got fired. Wants something in her line. Yeah, well, Irma does typing. Yeah, you remember the one who typed that letter for your cousin Willie, asking the governor, governor for a pardon? Yeah, well, Joe, don't be sore. She just left out one word. I know she was supposed to write, I am not guilty, and she left out the not. <laughs> What's one word among friends? Then you're still sore, huh? Don't want to help her. All right, forget it, Joe. Goodbye. Well, what are we going to do now? Don't know, chicken. Looks kind of hopeless. Oh, well, I... Because I've just ruined everything. Oh, take it easy, chicken. Oh, no, I'm a burden to all my friends. I treat them all like beasts. That's what I am, a beast of burden. Chicken, chicken. Oh, the poor kid. Come in. Hello, Al. Oh, hi, Richard. Say, hey, where's Jane and Irma? Jane's out for a walk. Irma's in the bedroom, crying. Oh, about a job, eh? Yeah. yeah, she's taking it pretty hard. Well, that's why I dropped by here. Now, I might have a job for her. Oh. Irma! Irma, please come out. This is Richard. I want to talk to you. Hello, Richard. Tell her the good news, Richard. Well, it isn't definite, but I just left the house, and Mother's having tea with Powell Stuyvesant, the editor of Society Magazine. Now, he employs any number of girls, and I thought I might talk to him in the morning about employing you. Oh, Richard, you're so sweet... I could kiss you, but then Al would have to kiss Jane and we'd get all mixed up. <laughs> well, I uh, think I'll run over to Papillon Restaurant and see if Jane's there. Now, Irma, I'll call Mr. Stuyvesant in the morning and have him get in touch with you. Goodbye. Goodbye. 
Isn't it wonderful, Al? Just got an idea, chicken. What, Al? Why should we wait until tomorrow? Job might be filled. Why don't we drop in on Mrs. Rhinelander now and meet Mr. Stuyvesant socially? Make a big impression. Might even get a better job. But, Al, we weren't invited. We're in the clear. We got an excuse. We'll say we're looking for Richard. No, he won't be there. But, Al, you think it's right. Chicken, all big deals are not made in the office. It's on the golf course, at tea, at, at cocktails, at bridge. you got to handle it like the big shots do. Oh, but Mr. Stuyvesant is editor of Society Magazine, and Mrs. Rhinelander is... Oh, Al, I'll, I'll be so nervous. Uh, maybe I ought to read the book on culture and get some points. That book is a fake. I know the right things to say. We'll give it all to you in a nutshell. Oh, uh, all right, Al. Uh, I'm ready. Fine. Now, first, upon entering a mixed crowd, make conversation of general interest. Now, these people are high society, so we discuss the Cabots and the Lodges. The Cabots and the Lodges. Yeah, also, you drop a comment that you are getting ready for the horse show. You got it? I've got it. Okay, chicken, we go. Strike while the iron is hot. If things go right, in an hour you should have a swell job amongst classy people. All right, Al. Oh, uh, just a minute while I take everything out of my handbag. Well, why are you doing that, chicken? Well, the book said the polite guest never arrives at a party loaded. <laughs> January 19th, 1948, My Friend Irma on Classic Radio Theater. Here's some great news. If you miss the deadline to sign up for health insurance, or if, like a lot of people, you just have a plan you're not happy with, you still have a choice. It's called MediShare. It's a Christian healthcare sharing program. There are more than 400,000 members now, and they love it. In fact, MediShare has double the customer satisfaction rate compared to that of health insurance. And MediShare really is the gold standard when it comes to healthcare sharing. It's been around more than 25 years. Members have shared more than $4 billion of each other's medical bills. Plus, MediShare is for you. It has saved its members billions by advocating on their behalf. Best of all, the typical savings for a family is around $6,000 a year. So if you think you're stuck with a high-cost health plan that doesn't have much to offer, think again. MediShare has a 98% customer satisfaction rating, and you are invited to be part of it. Call now. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater here on your favorite station. Now the conclusion of My Friend Irma, starring Marie Wilson, January 19th, 1948. All right, chicken. Now before we ring, have you got everything straight? Uh, I make general conversation. Uh, uh, I'm getting ready for the horse show, horse and I show. talk about the cabots and lodges. Okay, I'll ring. Oh, Irma and Al, what a pleasant surprise. What are you doing in the neighborhood? Uh, we, uh, we, uh, just dropped by to see Richard. But we know he's not in. Please, Richard. <laughs> you look very lovely, Mrs. Ryland. Well, thank you. Won't you come in? Irma, I've never seen you looking so attractive. Thank you. I'm getting ready for the horse show. You're holding chicken. <laughs> Irma, now, while you're here, I'd like to have you meet my guest, Mr. Paul Stuyvesant. Paul, this is Irma Peterson and her boyfriend, Al. How do you do? Delighted. Dorothy. Now that your friends are here, how about a rubber of bridge? Bridge? <laughs> well... Delighted. Grand thought. <laughs> well, uh, then let's sit at this table. Irma, how would you like to be partners with Mr. Stuyvesant? Oh, I'd rather work my way up slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Girl's got a great sense of humor. Uh, are these the cards? <laughs> yes. Mind if I count them first? <laughs> I beg your pardon. A mere formality. Save me many a buck. Uh, shall we make a polite conversation? If you find it necessary, Emma. Mr. Stuyvesant, uh, do you know the Cabots? No, I've never had the pleasure. Do you know them? Well, I've never been to the Cabots' home, but I've been to their lodge. <laughs> shall we deal? Yes, quickly. Uh, let's see now. Uh, uh, what's of mutual interest to everybody? Chicken, you're supposed to make conversation, but it don't mean you can't stop. One spade. Two diamonds. Seven no trump. I uh, beg your pardon, I didn't get my partner's bid. Seven no trump. Seven no trump. If you folks don't mind, I'd like to see my partner's hand. Miss Peterson, how can you make a bid like that? Why not? You're vulnerable. 
You haven't got an honor. Mr. Stevenson, I'm not discussing your character. I don't see why you should discuss mine. Take it easy, chicken. Oh, Mrs. Rhinelander, this is impossible. I think I'll be running along. No, no, no. Please, please, Paul. I can explain. Please. Gee, Al, I think I made a wonderful impression. Don't know about that, chicken, but you sure performed a great trick. What was it, Al? You changed a four-handed bridge game in a double solitaire. Oh, hello, honey. I've been waiting for you. Hello, Jane. I ran into Richard. He told me the wonderful news. He's going to speak to Mr. Stuyvesant first thing in the morning about a job for you. Oh, Jane, I, I don't think I'll get along very well with Mr. Stuyvesant. Well, sweetie, you haven't even met the man. How do you know? Well, that's silly, Jane. I've never taken poison, but I know I wouldn't like it. Irma, what are you talking about? <laughs> Jane, if that's Richard, don't answer it. Why not? It may be a wrong number. Irma, y you're really acting ridiculous. I... Hello? What, Richard? Yeah, yeah, she just came in. No, she wouldn't tell me where she's been. She... What? At your mother's playing bridge with Mr. Stuyvesant. What happened? Oh, Richard, is your mother angry? She's not. Oh, bless her. Are you angry? You're not. What about Mr. Stuyvesant? He's what? He's given up cards, has locked himself up in the Harvard Club and refused to go. Oh, Richard, you're kidding. Was it really that bad? I see. Excuse me, Richard. I want to have a talk with Irma. Bye. Irma. Irma Peterson, how could you? Oh, I'm sorry, Jane. We were so anxious to get the job, and we wanted to do it the social way. You know, we would strike while the iron is hot. Well, you certainly cooled it off. <laughs> oh, honey, goodness knows when you'll get a job, and they'll take the piano back, and how we pay our bills, and I just... Oh, Irma. Hello? Who? Mr. Clyde? Yes, Mr. Clyde. You want me to come back to work? Well, why? Oh, because you don't know where anything is and you have to go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> oh, and you have to go to a psychiatrist anyway. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Clyde, I'll be there first thing in the morning. <laughs> West 73rd Street is back on a paying basis. I'm working, and Irma's got her old job with Mr. Clyde back. So the piano's here to stay, and Irma practices it diligently. You know, sweetie, I'm delighted in your interest in music. Why do you practice standing up? I have to. I'm learning the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> nothing I can say except hats off to my friend, Irma. My Friend Irma, presented by Swan, another fine product of Lever Brothers Company, was produced and directed by Cy Howard. Tonight's script was written by Cy Howard and Park Levy. Folks, next Monday evening, listen again to... Our friend, Swan, with my friend, Irma. Starring Mary Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. The part of Professor Kropotkin was played by Hans Conried. Frank Bingman speaking. January 19th, 1948, my friend Irma on Classic Radio Theater. What does it mean to be an American? Just what are our American values? Working hard to succeed. Loving God, country, and family. Being honest, strong, and compassionate. Supporting our Constitution and recognizing that we are blessed to be living in America, the greatest country in the world. Our Bill of Rights protects us, our freedoms of worship, speech, and privacy, our right to own firearms, our right to trial by jury. Our right to be free, to live our own lives without some bureaucrat telling us what to do. Most countries don't have these rights. Want to know more? It's all there in the book. 
Get your own free book, The U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Then read it again, and this time, share it with your friends. Our great Constitution is the basis of all of our freedoms, our inalienable rights. Get your own copy at freeusbook.com. Brought to you by the American Media Council. Now on Classic Radio Theater, an episode of the children's serial Captain Midnight. This was originally broadcast January 19th, 1940. The Skelly Oil Company presents Captain Midnight. Captain Midnight, brought to you three times each week by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Jobbers and Dealers. But say, fellows and girls, have you got that grand free gift I told you about the other day? That swell big new picture of Captain Midnight and his two young friends, Chuck and Patsy? Well, if you haven't, you better stop by your Skelly service station for your copy the very next time you're out in the family car. Because you'll certainly want to have one of these marvelous pictures as soon as you see them. Remember, you can't get these pictures anyplace else in the world. They're not for sale anywhere. And they're autographed to you by Captain Midnight and Chuck Ramsey and Patsy Donovan themselves. They're standing right in front of Captain Midnight's speedy monoplane. And they're all dressed in their flying suits and helmets, ready to take off. It's the kind of picture every air-minded fella and girl will be proud to own. So listen, why not be the first one in your room at school to have one? Wouldn't that be fun? Well, here's all you do to get this swell new picture absolutely free. It isn't going to cost you a single penny, even for a stamp. You don't need any seals or labels or box tops or anything like that. You just have mother or dad stop by your Skelly service station the next time you're out in the family car. Show your Skelly man your Flight Patrol membership card, and he'll give you your free picture right on the spot. If you're not yet a member of the new 1940 Flight Patrol, Tell your Skelly man, and he'll show you how to join and get a free Spinner Medal of Membership. That's all free, too. Yes, sir. Just ask your friendly Skelly man about it the next time you're out in the car with mother or dad. Now, don't forget, you'll sure want to have that swell autographed picture of Captain Midnight and his two young friends, Chuck Ramsey and Patsy Donovan. And they're absolutely free to members of the 1940 Flight Patrol. So stop by your Skelly service station and get your very own free copy of this marvelous new picture tonight. And now to Captain Midnight. The famous pilot, accompanied by Chuck Ramsey and Ma and Patsy Donovan, has found Major Barry Steele and Bud Conley in a deserted part of Mexico, several hundred miles below the American border. Conley, however, is dangerously ill with some kind of tropical fever. Major Steele himself is weak and thin from lack of food. It is now an hour after Captain Midnight made his landing. Patsy and Ma Donovan are caring for the rescued pilots, while Captain Midnight and Chuck are looking over the small clearing in which Captain Midnight landed the plane. Let's listen as Captain Midnight says. Tell you the truth, Chuck, I knew when I landed here that I couldn't take off again with the plane loaded as it was, even under the most favorable conditions. And now, since I've been on the ground, I know such a takeoff would be impossible. Oh, gosh. Well, then what are we going to do? You're going to make the takeoff, Chuck. After watching you take that plane out of the small square in front of the temple, I'm well sold in your ability. And don't forget this. There's 50 pounds difference in weight between us. You want me to take off with Conley? Well, I'm not so sure yet, Chuck. It depends on what Mrs. Donovan says about his condition. I may have you take off alone, go for help, and then return. Or we may decide to take a chance in sending Conley with you. Is Conley's condition very serious? Yes, Chuck, I think it is. Mrs. Donovan hasn't said much. But what she hasn't said carries more weight than spoken words. Yeah, I've seen a lot of tropical fever, Chuck. It's bad. But Ma Donovan's doing all she can to check it, isn't she? Oh, of course she is, Chuck. But don't forget, we're not equipped like a hospital. All we've got is a few quinine tablets. Oh, gosh. If the wind would only change. Yes, we'd better pray for that. Because I'm afraid Bud Conley's life depends on it. I've been looking at the field again, Captain Midnight. But there just isn't any other way to get off. No, Chuck. I've studied this clearing from every angle. A shift in the wind is our only chance. Of course, if I'm to take off alone, or even with Conley... We can do a few things to lighten the plane without dumping any gas. Mm, sure we can, Chuck. And I'm taking that into my calculations. Now, I figure we'll take out the right front seat, the two rear seats, and clean out the baggage compartment. 
We could even take out part of the wall leading from the cabin to the baggage compartment and fix a place for Conley on the floor. Uh, sure, we can do all those things, and they'll help a lot, too. Ah, oh, gee. What's the matter now, Chuck? Oh, I was just thinking. We don't know how far away from civilization we are, and it certainly isn't likely we could get Conley out on foot. Or do you think we could? No, Chuck, no. I don't think there's a chance. We might start and find it would take a couple of weeks to get out. We haven't got enough provisions for a trip like that. And our very existence would depend on our ability to shoot game for food. And in the meantime, Conley would die. Yes, that's certain. Uh, so our only hope lies in using our plane. And we're even prevented from doing that. Yes, I know. Well, come on, Chuck. Let's go back to camp and see how Major Steele and Conley are getting along. Okay, let's go. Uh, I certainly hope he's going to be all right. Hi there, Captain Lake. Hello, Chuck. Well, how's everything, Patsy? How's Major Steele? Well, I can speak for myself now, thanks to Patsy and Mrs. Donovan. That broth they gave me has made me feel like a new man. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear that, Barry. Man, you look a lot better, too. Yes, uh, I feel I'm going to live now. But before you got here, I had my doubts. How's Bud Conley? You'll have to ask Patsy about that. She was in to see her mother a couple of minutes ago. What about her, Patsy? Well, I just helped Ma give him some more quinine, but I'm afraid he isn't any better. Did Mrs. Donovan take his temperature? Yes, it was 104 and a half. Mm. Good night. 104 and a half. Well, that's pretty high, isn't it? Yes, it's plenty high, Chuck. Can't stand that very long. Yes, I know he can't. We're going to get him out of here just as quickly as we can. But for the time being, our hands are tied. Well, that doesn't sound very good. What did you find out when you looked at the field? We found out this much. A takeoff can't be made until the wind shifts to the north. What direction is it blowing from now? I can't feel any breeze down here. No, we're protected under the trees. But the wind is coming from the south. And it's got to shift around to the north, you say? That's it. But gee, Captain Midnight, the wind might not shift for days. Yes, I know. That's true, Patsy. And if it doesn't shift, it's going to put us in a bad situation. You mean us or Bud Conley? Well, primarily Bud Conley. But it may put us in a bad situation, too. We only have provisions enough for a few days. And so far, I haven't seen a bit of game. No, it's plenty scarce, and I can't understand it, because this is a wild country. Oh, by the way, uh, I was going to ask you, have you done any exploring, that is, before you became so weak? Ah, uh, yes, both of us. Before Conley got sick, tramped around for miles, but we didn't find a sign of human life. We could only estimate our position roughly, and from the map, we were afraid we were some distance from any town. We considered starting out on foot, but finally decided to be more dangerous than staying with the ship. I think you made a wise decision. If you had started to walk out and then Conley got sick, you'd have been sunk. Yeah, there isn't the slightest doubt about that. Gosh, Major Steele, you probably thought that when you didn't come back to us, that we'd start looking for you. No, Chuck. I had very little hope of that. The situation being what it was when I left you, I was afraid your hands would be full. They were, Barry. Only too full. As a matter of fact, I think we were lucky to get away as quickly as we did. Well, go ahead. Tell me about it. There isn't anything we can do for the time being. Mrs. Donovan is taking care of Conley, and you can't make a takeoff until the wind changes. So let us know what happened. Well, the thing you'll be most glad to hear is that Senor Pareda and his daughter Dolores are safe. Well, thank heaven for that. Well, that's the good news we have, Major Steele. But we've got some bad news, too. Bad news? Well, what could be bad news after that? Chuck's right, Barry. We do have some bad news for you. Now, you remember that you and Conley were trapped in that deserted cabin on the edge of that little mountain field where you landed? Hmm. I'll say I remember. That's one of the narrowest escapes I ever had. We couldn't get out of the shack because the place was surrounded by armed men. And then, the dirty rats set fire to it. And if you hadn't found that hole in the floor leading to the old mine shaft, you wouldn't have had a chance. No, Chuck. Conley and I would have been just as dead as that old tree trunk that you were sitting on. But I still haven't told you the bad news. Who do you think those men were working for? The ones who had you trapped? I haven't got the faintest idea. Mexican bandits, I suppose. It was a lot worse than that, Major Steele. You tell him, Chuck. Okay. Well, Major Steele, those men were working for Ivan Shark. Ivan Shark? Well, what do you know about that? Yes, it was Ivan Shark. He'd stolen Senor Pareda's hacienda and was trying to make away with both the Pareda treasure and the huge herd of cattle owned by the Pareda estate. Why, it seems almost incredible. But what's the bad news? Well, when things ended... Ivan Shark escaped. Escaped? Huh. Well, cheer up, Captain. After all, you're all alive and have your health. We'd better be thankful for that. And we are, too. But it would have been a lot better if we had captured Ivan Shark. We almost had him in our hands, too, Major Steele. The morning he escaped, Captain Midnight and I missed capturing him by about a minute. Well, a minute can be like 24 hours sometimes, Chuck. Some of the minutes I've been through lately have been like that. And another bad thing. Shark's chief lieutenant, his daughter Fury... An Oriental named Fang and a fellow named Gardo all escaped with him. Did he escape by plane? Yes, Barry. In that same plane, Shark was flying when he was going under the name of Douglas Chadwick. Yes, I remember. A bi-motored silver-winged monoplane. That's it. 
Same plane passed over this place the day before yesterday, about noon. What? I thought sure the pilot would see the torn wings of the Spartan on top of the tree. Loopin' loops. What do you know about that? Wait a minute. Which direction was he flying? Almost straight north. The same course that you were flying. Oh, gee, Captain Midnight. Why, a shot must have headed for the United States. Evidently, because Connie and I were flying on the same course. We were headed for the nearest United States border. Well, of all the nerve. Oh, I wish I knew where he was headed. Well, there's no telling about that. Well, I wish I had known who was flying that ship. I'd have tried to broadcast a warning. Though I guess it wouldn't have done any good, because you're the only ones who heard my call for help. But you haven't told us what happened to you, Barry. Well, there isn't very much to tell. As I said, we were headed for the nearest point on the border. About a hundred miles after we left you that morning, the engine began to overheat. But it was very gradual, otherwise I'd have returned back. Yeah, I was afraid of that. The gas you had wasn't suitable for the Spartan's engine. But then, what happened next? Well, as the engine got hotter, we started losing revs. And then, little by little, we started losing altitude. There was only one thing to do, keep on going. I thought there might be a chance to keep the plane in the air until we got across the border. But finally, even after we'd thrown out everything that we could, we were right over the treetops. At last, I saw we couldn't make it. I was trying to pancake into that clearing ahead when we mushed into the trees. That must have been a terrible moment. Uh, we thought we were finished, I can tell you that. But we had strapped ourselves in tightly and weren't going very fast. And when we started scraping in the treetops, I started pulling the nose up. Succeeded in killing some speed that way. Well, Barry, you and Conley are lucky to be alive. Come on, Chuck. Let's get back to the plane. We've got a job to do. Okay, Captain Midnight. What is it? I'm going to send a code message to the authorities to be on the lookout for Shark's plane. Then, we're going to start lightening the ship so we can be ready when the wind shifts. Look, there's Ma in the doorway of the Spartan. Oh, well, Captain Midnight, can you come here? No, certainly, Mrs. Donovan. Wait a minute, Chuck. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, what is it, Mrs. Donovan? Please come inside. I want you to look at Mr. Conley. Oh, yes, of course I will. I'm afraid Mr. Conley isn't any better. Yes. His face looks very plucky. Oh, I see you have a thermometer in his mouth. Yes, and I want you to look at his temperature. Here, here's the thermometer. Let's see. Can you see? What is it now? Yes. Yes, I see. It's 105. Oh. Captain Midnight, we've got to do something for Mr. Conley. I've done all I could, and yet his temperature keeps going up. That can't go on much longer. You know what that means. Conley is in a very critical condition, or Mrs. Donovan wouldn't have brought Captain Midnight into the cabin to tell him what she did. But what can Captain Midnight do? The only chance of helping Conley is to get him to a hospital by plane. But the plane cannot take off until the wind shifts. If then, what will happen? Tune in Monday to Captain Midnight. Can some way be found of saving Bud Conley's life? With the takeoff by airplane impossible, are Captain Midnight and his party stranded beyond reach of help? Be sure to listen Monday. Until then, this is Don Gordon, your Skelly Man, saying goodbye and happy landing! <laughs> And, you know, I shouldn't need to say this, but these offers are well out of date, so they're probably not available. Captain Midnight, January 19th, 1940 on Classic Radio Theater. Come visit my webpage, classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about Classic Radio Collecting, and contact me there, classicradio.stream. Don't forget that if you miss a day, you do not have to miss a single show. Uh, you can uh, hear our programs anywhere podcasts are served, including uh, Spotify, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and even through uh, the Audible app through Amazon. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. And uh, by the way, while you're at my webpage... Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Just follow those links. I'm Wyatt Cox. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater on your favorite station.